Hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing, live show number 392. I am your host, Lauren Gray. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, welcome to another fun edition of discussing what's happening in the world today. We're going to look back at certain times and say, oh, yeah, I remember when that happened, or I remember when that went from that to this. Transitional points, and we'll get that a little bit in our news coverage today and so forth, but it, it was a bit of an inspiration to our topic today that I want to just dive right into because it's very much about how quickly things change in our world as to how, what tools are available and how we use those tools, how those tools are perceived by people and so forth. The news item we're going to talk about today, of course, obviously, is the impact of ChatGPT. It's released earlier this week on Bing. Limited view is getting broader. More people are being able to see it, be able to use it and so forth by now. Uh, still a creep and crawl. It's not fully integrated with everything you do with Bing, uh, but it's changed it. Obviously, Google made its announcement earlier in the week that um, there was this, uh, they, they're going to change their own launching of their chat engagement uh, program to it. There's been a lot of news coverage, obviously, because that's the buzz techie thing. You know, thank goodness they took the VR headsets off of everything that was new and innovative for their ad campaigns. Uh, but the idea of that chat GPT was changing the dynamics of schools and education and and getting information and and people are beginning the idea that the content isn't always is not based on truth and accuracy as it is compliance to the data that's provided to the to the AI device to create the content and that's a danger of these things because it's so easy to create literally false information that sounds very uh, truthful just because of its inherent nature of how it's written so to the reason of the topic today why all this created this catalyst of what our topic is today I want to talk about proactive versus reactive marketing, but not in a contrast of this is good, that is bad, okay? But in the real true perspective of how to do both of them well. Um, I would love to say that we are so knowledgeable about stuff that we will always be proactive, but nothing will surprise us. Oh, we already had a plan for that. Oh, that was already in our strategy. This was already in our pipeline. This was already in our workflow. This was already in our funnel, whatever fun way of saying it is, the reality of it is uh, we get surprised. There are changes that are unexpected, things that happen that were just not something that was on the board. Um, I know that when it comes to operations of hotels, our clients and relationship and people that I talk to that of their clients in our hospitality marketing club so to, uh, that we talk about, um, there's always the Restrictions of our industry where budgets were defined, they were diluted over an averaging of 12 months, uh, or their percentage impact was put on certain months and so forth. And there were unrealistic numbers. There was no way that you were going to have a 20% growth in January when you knew that probably year over year numbers would be at best the same. Uh, but you did that because you had to dilute the budget metrics over the course of 12 months. And if you didn't assign some value of increase for January because the mandate from ownership was that there was a growth requirement, then you would have been not keeping your job in security because you were not doing what you're being asked for those that write your paycheck. So the realities of that in our industry are one thing. Um, oh, I just noticed I, I shifted myself a little bit over to the right. So I'm not dead center. I'm off to the right. Wanted to block the really crazy wires because we have our drywall ripped out and stuff. So um, I'm trying to mask some of the mess that's around us and show off the fact that, oh, look at all these conferences I spoke to. Look at all these badges. And here's my propped up old sign that still says digital on it. But more importantly, here's the microphone that has the swag and the shirt. So anyways, sorry, I digress. The idea that uh, we have to have these financial markers that we're supposed to hit versus the reality of actually being able to hit them. Now, there's a pleasant surprises that go on that we actually exceed the numbers that we anticipated because of changes in the market that we were unaware of, uh, which can be anything from inventory and market changes to demand market changes, um, perception of market changes, um, other events that cause traffic that you weren't planning on getting, all of a sudden you're getting. Lots of variables that happen to that. And it's nice to be as responsive in your modeling of what you did for budgets and forecasts and strategies. But from a marketing perspective, you usually try to plan out, and we go, this goes back to our earlier budget discussions from last year. You try to plan out the things that you know, try to identify the things that are recurring, and then try to identify the things that you're trying to develop. And in that process, you look at timelines. We've talked at great lengths about using social as a catalyst of creation 
uh, early on to create engagement and content and dialogue. And that progresses into a paid campaign that begins to make it more aware of what you're producing content wise in front of people because you're paying for that ability to do so. Then you selectively choose the channels that are um, more viable for you to get in front of the audiences that you've identified through the personas and the identifiers of the markets that you are looking to target. And you create the campaigns that better put a sharper point to the pencil for that. And you all do this in a timeline that progressively works towards the goal of the highest transition of those people's interest to the time of actual execution of purchase. And then you have the engagement of them during their stay with you. And then the residual lifetime engagement that you try to create from that and the means of communication. We've talked about all those things. But I want to clarify it now from a different perspective of knowing about it and not knowing about it, being proactive about planning for it and reactive of having to respond to something that was not anticipated or planned for. Um, marketing is slightly inflexible when it comes to which tools work best. In a proactive environment, let's take, for instance, an event that's in the latter part of the summer. You know the dates of the events themselves. You know historically what types of demand may have been to market, and you know historically your impact of interest on those people for coming for that event. Um, whether you, you're a new hotel and you have built a hotel knowing that this was going to be an eventual value proposition for you because you were building it next to an event area or that it's these are the things that happened to it, this was the due diligence of creating the hotel in its existence, then it's still a predetermined thing of awareness. Now, you may not know to the full extent of your role in it, but if you've never run that season yet. You haven't actually been a hotel when that event happened, but there's an anticipation that there's going to be a demand interest that you'll be able to fill. One of the causations of the investment of building the hotel. With that in mind, um, that or having lived through it, you know an anticipated business cycle. So you know a lot of information, where these people come from, when do they start looking for you? These are metrics that you can get into your analytics and look at and see when people begin to search for. Go to the history of what, the, what terms and keywords they use. What was their engagement with the ads and the information that you've provided back when the, the year before, the year before that? And given the circumstances of our past few years with COVID and lockdown and so forth, you're going to have to go farther back than historically you normally would have to get an average weighted mean of the impact of these types of events. This might be the first year that the event comes full circle the way it used to be before the lockdowns of COVID. It may have been a recurrence from one that was initially done last year when there was still the ability to have it last summer, when we were having the tsunami summer that we had last, last year, uh, or the summer before that even. Um, so there's there's ways to validate what you're planning and pre-planning and proactively creating ad campaigns that maybe now you're creating content on your social platforms, talking about and sharing useful information about the event for people to become aware that you're a valued authoritative resource of knowledge and information that can be shared with people that are interested. That's gonna get translated into small trickle campaigns, ad campaigns where you're gonna be sharing content um, with people that are searching for these. You're paying to be in front of these demographics. And that's eventually going to blossom into a larger paid campaign where you might begin to solicit offers of what you're offering during that event cycle. And because of that, um, you're getting early conversions. So you're getting compression of interest to know whether your rate strategies are on par. You're seeing what your competitive set is doing. You can voyeuristically looked in, as we shared on tools on our podcast several times, the way to see what your competitors are doing in their paid campaigns and then their social campaigns to know whether or not you are augmenting your assets and uh, exploiting their weaknesses. SWOT analysis. So that's proactive. And that's a something we talk about quite regularly as to things that you do for marketing. This is the planning stage. This is the coordination. You coordinate with the KPIs of revenue growth that your revenue management is trying to hit. You're talking to your operations team for fulfillments. It's a, I see it on the horizon. We've made plans for it. We have an executed program for this. We have a timeline, a pipeline, a, a workflow, a funnel, whatever buzz you want to say about it. You have a plan. That's great. Then there is the, what happened? <laughs> the reactive things. Um, a group block loss. We had that conversation last week where we talked about the better usages of YouTube videos and how to get in front of people uh, in a shorter window of opportunity and how to influence and using CRM to create custom audiences and target people based on the probability of them, the, the, the offers that you're giving them to be valuable and to take out the people that you might 
find that would put money back on the table by finding your better discovered offer because of filling a hole. If these sound unfamiliar that you didn't watch last week's show, I highly recommend you go back and watch show number 391. We talked about the modalities of doing short window targeting with YouTube video ads, uh, targeting them by channel, targeting them by timestamp, targeting them by uh, device, you know, TV being the predominant one. Uh, we went into detail with that. Well, that was a reactive marketing campaign. That was a, oh, this happened. It's in a short window. We didn't have all this lead road one way, buzzword, 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 of uh, time to plan and stage and set and progressively go towards an end goal. This is a dropped in our lap. This is a problem. What can we do? There's only certain tools in marketing that have that type of short reactive capability. And the YouTube ads were one of those tools we talked about at great length last week. I'd like to expand on that because I got some great emails from you all some great feedback and and thank yous, which by the way, thank you for thanking me uh, for sharing some of that information that some of you actually started using that strategy and that you found the same benefits that we found by explaining it. Um, there is other things that you can do that help with that expeditiousness. Now, one way is not probably a, such a clear path, but one I want to address. Uh, I have gotten a lot of questions and it actually came up in our advanced uh, hospitality marketing club discussions. Uh, not because it's an advanced technique or not because it's it's actually a technique that is liked by a lot of professional hospitality marketers, but it's a means to an end. And that is uh, Google's Performance Max. Performance Max is a second iteration of what Google has tried to do on creating a one-stop-fits-all solution for people. It realizes for you to spend money with them that you need to understand what you're spending money on. And more importantly, that you get the benefit of what you spent the money on in a way that you want to spend more money. Now, obviously, if you give them $1,000 and you don't make at least whatever, five, 10 times that, you're less likely to give them $1,000, especially if you spent $1,000 and didn't make $1,000 back. They're, you're very unlikely to give them another $1,000. They realize a lot of that it has to do with familiarity of the platform, usability of the platform, and the education that goes along with it. So to make it easier for some people, they created... Uh, at first was the the short and abbreviated ad assistant program that they had. That was a debacle because it, it what it did was it locked campaigns in. And then because you made them, it wouldn't let you unlock them or shut them off. You had to fight with Google to stop doing the automations. Crazy. Then they tried to influence suggestions within those that made ad campaigns where they were like, well, hey, if you did this optimization, you know, helpful guides to say how to make it better. Usually, unfortunately, what they usually always recommend is spend more money, spend more money, which created a skepticism of whether or not they were getting good advice or not. Then the third was they started interjecting with all these third party yahoos that were like, hi, I work for Google and I'm here to help you with your ad campaigns. When they were just ad hoc people that were thrown into on a call sheet to call down people that had Google ad lists to saying I'm your custom ad administrator helper. And all they were, it was an intermediary to get a commission off of running your ad campaigns and jacking them up higher. So now we have Google's Performance Max. I do lend some merit to the Performance Max platform because of one major asset that it didn't do in all the other iterations I just whined about. And that was it included all of them, your display networks and your other variations of Google. I just say display network because it's one of the ones that is hardest to explain to people, hardest to get funding for, but also sometimes the most impactful because of its brand exposure. So this performance max basically says, hey, tell us what you're selling. Tell us a little bit about what who you think is your best person to sell it to and give us this much money. And then if you can give us some pictures and you can give us some statements and if you give us some links, we'll make all your ads for you. We'll make all your videos for you. We'll make all your image ads for you. We'll give you all the ability to have all of our platforms get used for you that are applicable the way we see them you to sell your product on our platform for you. And it's a one-stop shop fix. Why are we bringing it up in this proactive, reactive marketing conversation? Because sometimes the bandwidth availability internally is insufficient to really do a broad spectrum advertising campaign. And what do I mean by that? Well, there's a lot more than just setting up an ad campaign and letting it run. There's the, ver the, ver the variances of the ads, the variance of the demographics, the filtering, but also the usages of the results of the ads. Uh, I'll give you an example. If you're running a particular promotion and campaign, and it's very much about a specific thing, going back to our event example, and you're doing that, as they are engaging with your ads, you're generating data. Google keeps track of who's engaging with the ads that you've been running. And that can create a custom audience. 
you don't know who they are individually, but you know who what they who they are because of how they interacted with your ads. And so because of that, then the group of people that interact with your ads can be created into an audience that you can say, hey, Google, take these people that are interacting with my ad. And I want you to make a new ad campaign that offers them a variation to what they've engaged with. They saw my ad, they engaged with my ad, they saw my video, they engaged with my video, whatever it is. But I want to try to hit them a different way. I want to talk to them in a different format. Um, and so you do a retargeting campaign. That's a fundamental first layer addition to an ad campaign is enhancing the engagement that the ad campaign is already running with with a re-enhancement of retargeting. It's that funnel process. And as much as that's a buzzword, it's a thing. It's okay, here's the traffic that came to our ads. This is how many people actually used the ads for conversion or went to the next stage that the ad was going to. And here's the people that didn't. What are we gonna do with those people? Well, let's go over and bring them back into the loop again by maybe on another platform like social, bring other content or bring them a different medium or a different device. And so we try to tuck them back in and then those people act on what we just brought them back into. And then there's a fall off people that don't. What do we do with those people? And we bring them back in a different way. That's a funnel. It's like trying to get as much yieldable engagement out of the people that you interact with, which is probably the most succinct definition I have had of a funnel in a long time. I can remember that one. Note to self. Anyways, so with that, comes the reactive and there's certain tools that something like a performance max can help because you can literally go in there dump in some money requalify what you're looking to do and in a very short order because google wants to produce results so you spend more money with them you'll have a much more active diversified campaign on this one-stop shop platform called performance max it's a fast dump is what I'm saying. It's a, a like, oh, we got to do something. We got to do something now. Whoa, we got to do this. And then we got to do retargeting. We got to do and all the stuff I just described with the funnel stuff. It takes time, takes energy, takes content, takes things to do, takes approval processes, takes a whole mess of stuff that by the time you actually get it slapped together, the event you're trying to shoehorn in for the short window that you've been given is probably passe or non-influential. With performance banks, you can go say, hey, look. Boom, here's some money, here's some basic stuff, here's some catch, here's some links, here's some content, here's some images we have. Go chug a mug it out. And it will. It'll do it pretty quick. Within 24 hours, you'll have campaigns running on all the platform stuff. It's fun and fast for that. Do I recommend it for all things? No, no, not at all. I do recommend it for certain circumstances and for certain infrastructures that just don't have the resources, but they need the diversity of what the platform has to offer. So Performance Max is another one, given circumstances, uniquely fitted, that that would be the case. Now, Going to this visualization, uh, last week I was talking about YouTube video ads, obviously, and the fact that they give the fast producers, you know, you can produce it and get it out. Well, the thing that I talked at great lengths about last week was the, the big wall for everybody is content. Not everybody has video content. Not everybody has image content. What they have is their predetermined, highly expensive, used for the website glamour shots of their front desk, pristinely empty. The restaurant, pristinely empty. Rooms, pristinely empty. Not a lot of uh, great video content there. And to make video content, I also talked to you about trademarks and uh, rights to use things. If people are visibly or identifiable in videos that you're making that you need written permission or express permission from them that they know that their likeness will be used for commercial purposes for you, that is a mandate on anything that you create. And there's a loophole to that. And that is AI generated content. AI generated content first can create original content that nobody else has because you asked an AI platform to create it. This is the tie together for our news content, by the way. Um, the other is AI will also pull copyright available media for creating video. Like a, a, on our podcast last week, we talked about tools that created YouTube ad content. Okay. And one was an animation called Steve AI. And I'm not trying to write into a lot show you, but it's one of many examples. Uh, Lumen5 is an older one that does that. Uh, there's others that do it. Uh, Animoto, uh, another one. Um, used them all over the years. And what's fun about them is that you can give them just the, the scene information you want. Like I want to talk about this, talk about this, talk about this, talk about this. And then it'll go say, well, what kind of format you want? You say, I pay like that format. And it'll go off and find images that match what you wrote, find audio to put behind it. And it can make it 
make a 20 second commercial or 30 second commercial, whatever, it'll do that. And then you can go in and you make some adjustments. Like I don't like that picture or that video snippet that they got. I want this one instead. Uh, I don't like the audio. I want to change that. I want to change what I wrote. I want to put this link in. You do that, but like this, in a few minutes, you could have your 15 or 30 second video ad that you need to do YouTube you know, load it up on YouTube and then refer to it in your ad campaigns and boom, it's running literally in less than an hour from inception to running, which is very much about what that reactive marketing requirement is, is the ability to say, I need this out now. The, the sooner I have it in market, the sooner it can start helping what I've been told is a crisis of short window. Some of the other things to this goes to the content that it does generate. And that is OTT advertising. A lot of times the need to get in front of many people that are targeted the most that you can identify is the catalyst reason of any success of short window reactive marketing. It's about how many can I get in front, not just by shotgunning it, which is the old way of marketing. Okay, all hands on deck, everything lights up, radio, TV, newspaper, magazines, billboards, front signs, road signs, whatever it is, let's let it all up. Because it was like, Anything, anybody splatter on a wall, spaghetti on a wall, anything that's up there, as long as it sticks. Now it's about getting it out to as many people with the caveat that are most applicable to actually be interested in the content. It's not about putting up anything anywhere. It's about putting it up in front of as many people that already are defined interested in what you have to say. That targeting. And the targeting is very much about the geography. What's my feeder markets for what the gap is that I need? Demography, who in those feeder, the geographic markets, demography wise, family composition, the ability to come here you know, drive market compared to fly market, depending upon the window of opportunity. Then you have behavioral. Is our product connected to these people? Like, are we that product that somebody's gonna to wanna to show up or do they feel like it's not the product for them? If, they're, if you're a family hotel, you're not going to get a metro urban traveler interested in some special offer you have two weeks out when they don't see your brand or your product in the spectrum of what they would be interested in staying at. So the behavioral interest, the persona identifications of these people is a paramount of issue too. So getting these filters correct and then getting this content out to them, you want platforms that are fast. Now, yes, you could create fat ad campaigns really fast, kind of like the performance max we're talking about. Let's say, hey, get it out, get it in multiple distribution points, get it in front of people as best as possible, target it as best as possible, is the same modality of saying, let's shotgun the heck out of this ad campaign. Let's go in there. And we do have off the shelf prepackaged emergency kits. Like, okay, we need these demographics and we have them already defined. It's already campaign just paused off to the side. We just need to change the ad, ad types, content, messaging, links, so forth. But the demographies are already locked and loaded. That's our spring locked and loaded. Great example of that is a little bit about a proactive ad campaign for winter time for the South going to the North. When it's early November and you get the cold snaps going on in the North, but when the first real cold hits up North and it sticks, that's a trigger for ad campaigns that were already built for that time that get hit to the north of our feeder markets to drive people to say, hey, it's cold, it's warm down here, come on down, make your plans, make your strategies, it's holiday time, whatever. That's a pre planned proactive marketing campaign that is similarly based to what you would set up as a in case of emergency campaign structure that sits dormant just waiting to plug in the messaging. And there's ones that you can have that. The better the agency, the better the planning, the better the diversity of campaigns are like, you know what, we have something for that. You know, what? we're looking for these types of people. And we just need to define the audience to the drive or the fly or the feeder or the demo or the behavioral. Let's qualify that, confirm it. Contents gend, taglines are fast, headlines are fast, dynamic fields are fast, links we just have to drop. Let's fire it up and pump it in. That happens. Not everybody has that. So what you need is alternatives to that. And you need platforms that can get the most bang for the buck for the content that you have. And OTT advertising is the step up from YouTube advertising in the sense of rich media in front of a lot of people really fast that are demographically, geographically, behaviorally targeted to see your messaging. I'll give you an example, not to share the client by name, but there was a, a weekend opportunity for them that was 
just a few days away from when we launched this. It was a video ad for it. It only ran within a few miles of the place. It only ran for 48 hours. And it was only dedicated to watching YouTube on TV. So that's granular, 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 granular. Okay. Um, several thousand people saw that ad. Several hundreds, actually almost a thousand, saw the whole ad in its completion, which for anybody that does video ads, 100% viewer rate is the, that's the thing you're happy about. They watched the whole thing. It was interesting enough for not to skip by, for the skip ads. Okay. 100% of the people watched the whole ad. That's pretty crazy. And, and, and most of them, okay, uh, over 76% of them watched over 80% of the video and uh, 100% of the video. So we saw a lot of people. And this was a very micro ad. I mean, it was only a handful of miles, like three miles most away from this location. And you could only see this ad if you watched YouTube on your TV, YouTube the app on your TV. And only watched it on those two days we had it running. That's how crazy that target was. It was instantaneous. We were able to make the ads, launch the campaigns, get it all set up within a matter of hours before the weekend hit and ran it and got those kind of numbers. That kind of responsive marketing is what we're talking about. These tools are very unique. It's not that you can't do that kind of uh, stuff. Okay. It's just this stuff is the things that you need immediate availability for when those circumstances arise. Kind of like what we talked about last week with the group loss of a couple of weeks out that we talked about in the live show and what we did for CRM and how we identified custom audiences and how we got the messaging out in front of these people for such a short window with the success of selling out the uh, replacing and selling out the group loss that we had. These reactive marketings. Nobody wants the knee jerk marketing. Nobody wants that. What the heck crisis are we putting out now? Nobody wants that high level RPM red line mentality all the time. You want the proactive marketings there. You want the strategies in place, the progressive multi-dimensional ad campaigns for a variety of targeting, for a variety of efforts running concurrently. But for the times that you have reactive marketing, you need tools that work. YouTube video works. OTT advertisement works. Uh, using tools as a shotgun, shove it in the breach, shoot it out, one-stop shop, performance max, Google stuff works. These are reactive tools that can function. Having pre-made conceived crisis ad campaigns or mirror campaigns that you know are asimilar to hang on to that says, wait a minute, that campaign structure, keeping good marketing logs to know how you set up a campaign structure with the filters you did for the purpose you did, those, those logs I always tell you about keeping when you build stuff on the shows that I keep badgering people about, this is where you look and say, flip through the book, go, oh yeah, we have a campaign that's very similar to what we need. We just need to make a few changes. And of course we have to put the right tenant and links in. Let's make the, the parameters work and shoot it out and get it out as fast as possible. That's that's strong reactive marketing to it too. So that was our topic today, discussing about how to do both proactive and re -mar reactive marketing well. I want to get to a news item because I think this week is one of those weeks, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, that is a, a, a stepping stone uh, week for us. Uh, I mentioned that Bing has rolling out their chat GPT, enhanced chat GPT, not the original one that had the 4 million variants, but now the one that's much larger, into their Bing results. At first, I was kind of always, first off, I, have, I always have an axe to grind about adjectives. I am always amazed in emails how many exclamation points get put in. The fact that even get one gets used back, you know, a few years ago was a, a thing. Now it's if you don't do three or four after a sentence, you're not as excited as you should be. Um, awesome is an overused word. I overuse it even. Um, uh, Mind-blowing, unbelievable. If it's unbelievable, how can we believe it? It's, I mean, I get, I get frustrated with the overuse of adjectives. Nobody says good anymore. It always has to be great. Phenomenal. It's we we have to up our. I mean, for even people to to think that we're interested or excited about something, we have to use these massive adjectives. So impression is a big thing uh, of anything. Google is the twenty million ton gorilla when it comes to search and marketing. Bing was always the you know should have done better, should have taken advantage of when Microsoft Internet Explorer was a thing before Google turned into a thing. They should have bought them. They should, you know, Yahoo should have bought Google, Sergey, and you know, whatever it is, they missed the window. And now they're underdog. 
And there's a few other variables outside of Bing, but it's usually just Bing and then it's like 11 to 14% of all search query. And then the rest is pretty much lion's share at Google. Google dominates, Google leads it. And then all of a sudden this little, I wouldn't say upstart, it's not a little upstart. They spend a lot of money doing this. Chat GPT get the novelty interest of everybody. Now, good isn't good enough. It has to be great. Chat GPT, I mean, the people realized that they couldn't treat it like a search engine. Uh, it was really for creative content, uh, for query explanations. It really wasn't about finding things. But it raised the big question about singular answers. The problem with singular answers, which is what Google says in its mission statement, if you ever read their mission statement, to be the ultimate assistant, digital assistant. That means that when you ask a question, you want an answer. Right now, when we ask Google a question, we get multiple possible answers. We get the best. No, not really. We get what they think is the best. Then we get what people pay to say is the best. And then we get what relevancy wise might be the best. And then somewhere along the way, the best is in there because Google doesn't truly really know the absolute purity of what you're looking for. They've gotten incredibly capable of interpreting. And we've talked about the technologies, understanding the combination of the word usages and so forth, rather than just the word, which is why we don't use keywords as much anymore as we use intent. That's a big word now. Um, but here comes along chat GPT. And now there's a dialogue component where you're getting an answer as if somebody's answering you. The problem with it is, is that it's hard to translate that into a monetization. How can one person pay to have the best answer or that what chat GPT would give you is the best answer when you need 10 people to pay for the option of baby being the best answer. That's how the paid platform makes its money is everybody's paying to be at least one of those options. So, it's not widely like, oh, this is going to be the next thing. I've even mentioned it when Chat GPT first came out a few weeks ago, a month ago, whatever, that the real stepping stone of what this represents is when it turns into a two-way interface. I ask something and it asks back the clarification so that I can respond so it gives me the best result of what I'm asking. That's not where we are right now. I ask something and then it will tell me something. Well, this step for Bing, putting in Chat GPT, means that they're challenging the modality, the perception of search results. Google is responding, which I don't necessarily agree with because that's bringing them to the level of the response rather than staying to what they are. But in the world of what Google is, and I think Tim Peter pointed this out best, Google strives for every time you use it because the minute you use it and it doesn't do what you need it to do, you're going to look for an alternative. And that's really what's at play here is Bing is now saying that they have a potential alternative. It may not be in the same context. It may not be used in the same way, but it is an alternative angle on getting to where you want an answer from. And so for that reason, Google has to address expanding or clarifying. So they're going to be adding their thing. China's even doing theirs. Everybody's jumping up because it is amazingly accelerating right now. It's, it's funny how we have, the uh, as a mankind, as a, as a species, we have the ability to solve anything we put our mind to. The idea is, why do we put our mind to it? Money is a driver for these things. More money gets into it, the faster things happen. The more opportunity for money to be made, the more interest in making it happen. And it's strange because money is a contrived notion on our part. And I'm trying to get an existential or theory, or philosophical on this, but that's it. We have the propensity to do all this stuff. We had the propensity to go live on the moon 50 years ago but it chooses that now is important enough to try kind of thing. Same too with this. AI is evolving in front of our eyes. We're seeing this being used. It will be used in for good. And as all things are, as Tim Peter, because I'm in a Tim Peter quoting mood, when they invented the ship, they invented the shipwreck. And it's true. Uh, as I know he says it's not his quote. He quotes somebody else, but he's the one that made it famous for me. Um, and so for that, there's going to be stumblings with this. There's going to be people that out of ignorance, willful disregard, whatever, are going to believe whatever's handed to them because it sounds truthful. It sounds the way they want it to be, so they believe it to be truthful because see, it's given to them. The caveat to all of this, and everyone's beginning to realize this, is that the AI creation content is based on the data that is provided. If that data is biased, if that data is inaccurate, it doesn't make a difference. It'll be produced from it. Uh, and so there's the buyer beware warning of, yes, the more we use this, the more likely it is that there's going to be a lot of dissemination of bad stuff. But to that end, the goodness of this is that it gives us another perspective of understanding what we want to learn from. 
Uh, and to that end, I think it's very interesting that Bing has made the bold step into it. Um, I, I looked forward to seeing because Google has been working with AI and, and has been using AI more than most people know, more than I know, more than because they, they only declare levels of things when it's necessary. But AI has been used in search result discovery information for quite a while. Uh, it just isn't so much in front of people. This dialogue, this chat aspect of AP, AI is a novelty that's garnered the momentum that it has. And so for that reason, Google is going to introduce its platform. Uh, that's a little bit like Skynet on uh, the Terminator movies. You know, it's a big club to squash a bug. Uh, it should be interesting how it gets used, how much it rolls out, what limitations are placed on it, and whether it's a full on, how can we monetize this to keep the momentum of, uh, of interest in Google and not let the light shine too much on Bing. So that's my news thing. Uh, that's that's the part that I think is most uh, intriguing. So with that, that's our news coverage to it. It's, it's an evolving thing that's happened this week. It's only going to happen more next week. It's going to only happen more the week after that. Uh, we'll have more discussions about usabilities of ChatGPT. There's already tools that are integrating not only just ChatGPT, but reflective. Uh, uh, oh, now that I said the word, I can't say it right. Um, reflective respect. There, there's another AI I use because of an R. I'm so sorry. I literally said the wrong word and I can't get out of my head. But there are other AIs out there and more platforms of usability are also out there. And you're going to see them more and more integrated into platforms you're already using because of the value proposition they can provide. So there you go. So um, thank you so very much for your attention. As always, um, whether you're watching us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, Twitch, our TV channel, hi which is also on Roku, Google, Amazon, and Apple. I thank you all for watching us live. And of course, if you play this back in recorded fashion, hopefully there was great value and merit for this. We always do recast our shows uh, at 1130 a.m. Sydney, Australian time, 1130 a.m. Uh, Wednesday, um, London, uh, EU time, uh, England time. So that way it's a little bit more comfortable for some of the time zones. Although that being said, as I look, there's always those of you that watch me from around the world. We're in 39 countries right now. Uh, thank you so much for that. And then to 209 on the TV channel. So I know we're on more places than I probably even have record of. So with that, my name is Lauren Gray. I thank you for the privilege of your time and look forward to talking to you next week.